Sanbunan. Sanbunan. So I, um, I know it's quite late in the evening, but if you give me the next 30 minutes of your attention, I hope to make it worth your while. Uh, before I start, huh, boy, I'm nervous. <laughs> I, I know what it is. It's Gillan and his stupid music. You mustn't play music like that for black people, because we're like, because <laughs> we're like, where, where, hey, where, where? <laughs> I also have to say that I, I, I find our beautiful country fascinating. Did you notice how all the Mlungus had their all-stars tied while they were up here? Did you notice? Now, I don't know if the Mlungus know this, but the whole point of the all-star was you never had to tie the laces. Hey, man, guys, you must learn, man. Hey, the comrades must level, man, levels. I'm going to be a bit difficult with you here today. I'm also going to be slightly controversial. If for no other reason other than I think it's about time. We're in an interesting time in this beautiful country of ours where never before has the center of power shifted from the old structures established prehistorically through law today to the ordinary man on the streets who exercises his right. And my view is that most of us don't understand the power that we have, and we don't even know how to exercise that power. So, here are two interesting businesses. One of them was owned by a friend of mine. His name is Wandile. He tells a fascinating story about how they started Lokshan culture. In the early days, and I don't know about you, but Mark, the reason I took this on very interestingly is when I started speaking professionally, I used to wear suits and all-stars, never sneakers, always all-stars. And clients and people would ask me why, and it wasn't a gimmick. It's because when I grew up, I think it's part of the reason I got quite emotional earlier. When I grew up, the only shoe that was branded my mom could afford to buy us was All-Stars. And so for me, the, the suit represented where I was going. The shoe spoke about where I'm from. And I think many of us in the room can relate to this. So my good friend Wandi started this interesting business called Lokshan Culture. He started it in uh, 95, 96, formally started it in 98. At the peak of his business, he ran about 80 million rand in turnover. Around the same time he started his business, 10 years prior, this interesting business was started called Mr. Price. Mr. Price today is just about an 11 billion rand business. Those numbers are dated by two years. So here's the question. If what one dealer does and what Arthur, my good friend at Mr. Price does, is the same thing, why did one of them outgrow the other by a mile? Here are two interesting businesses. I met an interesting entrepreneur called Tibo, Tabo. He operates and lives in Alexander. He runs a business that was run by his dad and was run by his granddad before him. His business is his puzzle shop. His popular commodity of sale in his puzzle shop is Ikoda. All of us here, know about Ikorda. If you don't, you've not had a quintessential South African experience. Now, he's been running his business for years. But I asked him, when did you formally start take, taking over the business? It was when he left high school in 2005. Last year, he employed three people. He did 53,000 rand in turnover the entire year. There's an interesting business called Kota Joe's. It was started by a group of people that belong to famous brands. They started their business in 2013. What do they sell? The same Kota Utabo sells in Alexander. And yet, in three years, they've grown their business to 20 million rand. They'll do 60 this year. They'll do 100 next. They'll be doing a billion, maybe in seven years' time. If what he did, Utabo, and what Kota Joe does is the same thing. Why is Utabo's business not growing? What's a bank? Put up your hand if your mom and dad ever had a stock fell or belongs to one. My mother belongs to so many stock fells, she was broke on the second of every month. <laughs> I was like, Ma, why? She's like, I'm like, Ma, fuck! 
And who are not allowed to swear in my household? That's why I speak so proper. <laughs> it's true, Dusty doesn't have to do up. You know how shocked the black people were when, he's, when Dusty started swearing? Because for us, hey, hey, hey. It's, I think houses are different. I look at my own household. Like my wife and I grow up very differently. My wife comes from a proper posh background. So when our kids are naughty, my son's name is Vussy. <laughs> the third. <laughs> levels, my child, levels. Levels. <laughs> when my son's naughty, I'll watch my wife. She goes, go to the corner. I'm fascinated by this idea of corners. Because <laughs> a black person, I'm like, how is this a punishment? <laughs> and then I worked it out. Do you know why black people never send kids to the corner? Because in the, in the rural areas where we come from, those rondavas, there's no corners there. <laughs> You'd be walking around, hey, the corner, Lil. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll stop, I'll stop. <laughs> so my mother belonged to Stockfell on Stockfell on Stockfell. There's an interesting Stockfell we met up with in the Eastern Cape. They're called Siangoba. They've existed since 1985. Do you know what a bank is? A bank is a Stockfell. The simple idea that you put your money somewhere, when Vusi needs to buy a home, he goes to the bank. Says, hey bank, I'd like to lend money. What they do is they collectively take all the money you've put in as deposits, lend it to me if I'm a good risk, price the risk, calling it interest, they use this thing called the interest rate, and the worst I behave as a consumer, they prime plus me over a 20 year period and I pay the money back, the bank makes a bit of interest and they pay you back your money. So all a bank is, is nothing more than a stock fail that has the license to lend the money out. So if my mother's belonged to a stock fail, this particular stock fail has existed since 85. Last year, they collected 300,000 rand in total collections of the members of the stock fail. APSA has existed only since 91, but APSA last year did 4.6 billion rand in turnover. Now, if what APSA does and Siang Oba does essentially the same thing, then why are the people of uh, Uno in the Eastern Cape who belong to the stockful of Siang Oba still ridiculously poor? And what I will argue here today very simply is this, that you and I have been fed a lie the lie is about this great idea called small business. Start one, just start, they tell you. And stay small, never disrupt, don't move things too much. Employ a person, maybe two. You show me one thing that you and I look at around here today that's been changed or fundamentally disrupted by a small business, you will not find it. 1978, my grandfather, now late grandfather, started a business. His business was his puzzle shop. And he took his garage, looking to make a bit of extra income, and converted his garage to a shop. And the neighbors would come down the street to buy from our, from our grandfather's puzzle shop. To this day, we're famous in our home for that puzzle shop. In the 1990s, he expanded. He moved further up the road. And up the road, there were two other houses. And into those two other homes, he got into their garages and converted those into his puzzle shops. And you know what happened in the 90s? My grandfather was living large. He now had three puzzle shops. But he started in 1978. When my grandfather died, now four years ago, he died with one puzzle shop and not much money to speak of. In the same year, 1978, when he started his puzzle shop, four young entrepreneurs met in a small little town called Stellenbosch in the independent province of Cape Town. <laughs> Cape Town, bro. And when they met, do you know what they did? They put together a little bit of money. One of them had a bit of money to speak of. His name was Christu. He had started a business called Pepco a decade earlier. So they put in a little bit of money into the pot and they created a business that was essentially a puzzle shop. They called it ShopRite. So in the same year my grandfather started his puzzle shop, so too did Whitey Basson and his friends start ShopRite. ShopRite this year, this year will do 124 billion rand in turnover. My grandfather died with nothing to speak of. My contention is that whilst there was a deliberate system that sought to keep us as a people disenfranchised, the greatest victory of that system is not that it kept black people disenfranchised, it's that it taught you and I that it's okay to think and do small. And this is a lie that's been fed so much to us that we believe it. We believe it, it's permeated even in our education systems, we believe it. And so when we start businesses, we think small. 
I can't tell you how many entrepreneurs I see start a business, register, go to the bank, open, get a bank account, go to SARS, get a tax clearance, and then start filling out database registration forms just to get that one tender. Because we're all thinking in a linear fashion. We're all thinking small. I did say I was going to be slightly controversial. If we really want to take this country forward, if we really want to do away with this problem of 43, not 38, 43% unemployment of young people under the age of 31, and of that 43% unemployment of those young people, 67 of them are young black. Of the component that's young and black, over 80% of those are young, black, and female. We don't change that problem in any other way other than building a country that's substantially better than it is right now. We only do that by teaching the majority of people, don't think small. It pained me when I was in Dragon's Den watching people come to pitch, because it hit me over and over and over again that specifically my people were thinking in exactly the same way. So how should we be thinking? It's one thing to kind of spell out the problem. What's the solution, right? My view, and we talk about this in our firm, we run a fund. There are four different types of businesses. The first is a startup. What's a startup? It's the one guy. It's him, he does the job. And it's easy to spot too, because he goes to the client on the Monday, meets him, sells to the client. On the Tuesday, goes to the client's office and delivers the work. On the Wednesday, goes to his office and emails the client the invoice. On the Thursday, phones the client asking for his money, and on the Friday, he pays his landlord. He's every single part of the value chain. That's not wrong, except so many of us have been taught that that's what business is. We don't know that there are other phases of it. If you're not a startup, you move a level up. You become what we call an offer, a survival entrepreneur. They're easy to spot. One guy, two or three people in the office. Feels a bit important. He drives usually a Merc. <laughs> Why? Well, because any self-respecting entrepreneur knows that the best car is a BMW. No one drives a Merc. <laughs> Sis, AMG for what, for who? <laughs> if you're not a survival entrepreneur, what are you? You then become what we call a success entrepreneur. Now, if you ever read the Sunday Times or you read the media in South Africa, and you'll hear them talk about these people called tenderpreneurs. Most of them are nothing more than success entrepreneurs. You know what success entrepreneurs are? It's people who make money to show you that they make money. Very simple. I make it, so I've got to show you that I make it. I wear the right kind of suit, I live in the right kind of suburb, I drive the right kind of car, I send my kids to the right kind of school. The other word, and my good friend Alon, who I saw earlier calls them, is lifestyle entrepreneurs. I make money to live the right kind of lifestyle. Notice, we've not created anything here, we've not employed more people, we've not built the country, we've not grown our GDP, we've not done anything to create a better country. All we've done is we've taken a few people and given them a better lot. That's all that's happened. What's really required is for us to create hyper-growth entrepreneurs. The thing here is these people are very rare, very rare, because one, they take the long-term view. Two, they don't believe in their own PR. Three, they understand the value of networks is not the network, but the ability to unlock value in that network. And three, and four, but perhaps most importantly, is they understand the value of education. Not a degree, not a certificate, education. Two days ago, I had a guy walk into my office. He's a growth entrepreneur, this guy. He just doesn't know it. He's an engineer, he's 34 years old. Dogoz is his name. And Dogoz was very interesting because he came to my office and he's looking for a bit of funding. He's got contracts that he's been servicing, he's been trying to finance the contracts themselves, it's just not working. So he says to me, I need a bit of funding. I said, what do you need, debt or equity? And we sit down, we look at his balance sheet, and here's what I found fascinating about Dogoz. He's an engineer by training, but when I asked him specific questions about his business, the mechanics of how it works, and then the finances of that business, he knew it backwards. He knew how much of his overdraft he'd used on which month and what the interest rate of that overdraft was and what the interest portion cost him in that overdraft. He knew how much his tax liability was last year, what his VAT liability was. Most of us don't know that who run our businesses. He knew what his capital structure was. How does an engineer know what his capital structure is? And yet this guy just does six, seven million rand a year. But he's a growth entrepreneur. He's genuinely interested in building a better South Africa. So I was on this show, unfortunately, 
I since learned that I was the bad guy on the show. Did you know this? Because I was like, but I'm the nice guy. What? What? Then I go to places, people are like, woo, woo, yes, you are so mean, yes, woo, woo, woo. You know, the worst thing a, a black person can say to you is woo. I don't know, you know what woo means? Woo means there are no words for you. There are just no words. I can't explain it. Again, this is what I love about this country, the nuance of what we miss, right? I mean, I, I you know, I, I, you know there, are, there are certain things that where I come from that when you say them, they have such depth, meaning, and substance. A simple thing like this. Now, I could say that in the boardroom, but yeah, the other guys wouldn't get it. If I said to a black person, even if they had two PhDs and they were chairman of the board, we are going to the street, Mchan. You said Mwah, to me. You don't understand. It's, it's what I love. I would love this about this country, right? Another one is how we greet. You ever notice? You know, you know, the, you know the black people can greet each other without saying a word. It's like. You know what this is? This is Eta. How's it? How's the family? How's the kids? How's everyone? How's things? Since I've last seen you, how are you? All of it with just a. And the other guy replies. You know what's the reply? It's just a wink. You know what the wink is? The wink is we're all good, it's all good. The home loan got approved, we live in large, it's okay. <laughs> One wink! But here's what I really love about us. I don't know if you know this, but where I'm from, we speak in numbers. Numbers, like for us, numbers is a language. So if you wanna to say to someone that you are um, uncomfortable, you need to go to the lavatory to relieve yourself, what you would say is, Eta, Go look via your shy six nine, your four five, and so one second enough. <laughs> Ma'am, write it down. I'll explain it when we're done. <laughs> very quickly, I'm running short on time, but I just want to quickly very sh show you two things. So I was on the show Dragons Den, and this is how I came up with this theory about the problem with small business. I'm going to show you two examples of entrepreneurs who came into the show and how the thinking was wrong. The first guy I'm going to introduce you to is the president. He called himself Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President had a theory. His theory was that the eye has as much intelligence and sensitivity as the anus. Two things that should never ever be compared, <laughs> but he compared them. Then proceeded to tell us that the show was shot in August. He said by December that year, which is about three, maybe four months, by December that year, his business idea, which was about um, understanding the sensitivity of the anus as an intelligent body part, um, would be worth one billion rand. Necessarily, we didn't invest. We thought the idea was just stinking. <laughs> but have a quick look at Mr. President. Guys, can you hit play? Absolutely. Uh, this is what it looks like. And it's been patented as such as an application. What you Turn see it around? Yeah, what you see here is a package of different items. All these items are to help harness or to monetize the opportunity. Uh, I studied the behavior of the human eye in relationship with the human anus. Nobody has ever conducted what? that study. The human eye yeah. relationship absolutely. with the and human anus. Ex absolutely. <laughs> guys, 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 I think, honestly, I think let's, just, let's just get to the point here. What I discovered is the fact that uh, these two organs are equally intelligent as far as sensitivity is concerned. We have a, a deal locally and in the US, all right? Locally, the, the, the stores, the, 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 the brand that we have a deal with, they have 140 stores across okay, the country. Okay, who are they? Should I say the names? Of course, yes, 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 yes. Micra stores, locally. Who? Micra. So, Micra stores have agreed to stock your product? In Absolutely, state? they need about 10,000 units to get us started. It's a cash deal. It's a cash deal? Yes. So, uh, you deliver, you get paid their day. Now we're talking. This is just not my game, and I'm worried that I'm gonna be flashing money down the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I respect you. I have to say that I'm out. Thanks. Thank you. But unfortunately, I won't be parting with my money today. I'm out. You know, there are so many other challenges in South Africa at this point in time. Yeah. And yours, I do not think it's a serious priority. Thank you very much. Do I have to say it? No, you already said it. Don't you love Lebu's response? <laughs> 
So when we were doing the show, we called Lebu the Oracle because someone would come and present something stupid and Lebu just like, you know, the philosophy of what you're doing. We're like, Lebu, no, it's stupid. It's <laughs> challenges. <laughs> now, here's an interesting idea. Here's how it actually worked. Listen to this. It's a dispenser. You put water in the dispenser. You take your toilet paper, double ply, I hope, and you would put the toilet paper in your hand and before you use it, apply, as it were, you would dispense water into it to make it soft and wet, because if you wipe with something that's soft and wet, it wipes better than if it's hard and dry. Fascinating. <laughs> Except that there's a little thing called wet wipes. I don't know if you've heard of them. You've heard of them? You buy them at Discam, you know, Ivan Saltzman's business. You open it up and the wet wipe, it comes out the way it is. So what's Satanda's real problem? He's got two real problems. The one is his thinking is wrong. He's trying to fix a problem that doesn't exist. A lot of us do that. You fix a problem that doesn't exist. Why? Well, because you go to an education system that tells you to identify issues that are there, apply problems that already exist, or solutions that already exist, and hope to make it better than everybody else. Most of us, in truth, are a dummy community. We copy the neighbor. That's why we drive the same brand of car, wear the same brand of suits, live in the same suburbs, send our kids to the same schools. Because as human beings, we find, I don't know if you know this, but psychologically, we find value in the tribe, that I belong to a group of people. Now, the second young lady is very interesting. I won't waste much time. Watch this. I need this investment so badly because it's going to be the key to starting up my business and to making a success of it and pursuing my entrepreneurial dreams. 360 Mobile Beauty is a mobile beauty salon that offers mobile beauty, hair and services to our clientele in the comfort of their own homes. 360 Beauty does, does away and moves away from traditional salons as we know them. We do away with brick and mortar and by, um, by leveraging um, innovation and technology and mobilizing our technicians, we offer a quality, unique service that's different from the norm. In a time where time itself has become very expensive and people are on the go and don't have time to sit in traffic, waste petrol, get to a salon even for the gentleman and still have to wait for your stylist, then be rushed through it because your stylist is trying to move a lot of people through the chairs for them to make turnover. I've adopted innovation through my cell phone mobile app and I've mobilized my technicians to deliver our service in the comfort of our clients' homes, at their office, at an event, wherever they choose, we're there. In terms of revenue generation, I've allocated and I've broken it down to two segments, services and product, because a lot of salons are making money from product sales. I've apportioned it to say 60% is, in, is, is, is raised from, from sales, 40% is raised from product. I've allocated a minimum spend for us to be able to go and render the service to a client of 800 rands. This is based on the research that I've done with salons and the prices they're charging for services and the like. 800 and rand is based on what? It's based on um, what a woman would spend for her hair, for her nails, for a pedicure, for treatment. So this is average like. spend? You so expect. this is average spend. Okay. So for someone to be able to book with us and for us to go to them, they need to be spending 800 rands, either both service and product or product alone or service. Uh, my challenge is I'm not convinced of the numbers. You know, I'm not, I'm not convinced that there's a big enough market that is going to be spending 800 rent each time. N no, I, I completely evolving. differ. But, but how big is that market? That, the point I'm making is how it's big is the market? It's huge and massive. It's huge really? and massive. Yeah. I mean, I mean, one I, of the I largest growing companies in South Africa at the moment is Kinky. They sell hair. They're massive. I, but I, how much is the hair? An average of 2,500 bucks. Yeah, we can split it two ways because I can support with the complete development of the app from my office mm -hmm. and really just remodel this thing. We can rework it together. But I really like, I think I like her thinking mm -hmm. and we can really work this thing together nicely. I think a five-way split of the 350 would be, would be a great sort of vote of confidence in you as a person. Are the two of you interested, before we even consider it, are the two of you interested in diluting any further? So for me, I understand the risks of what she's getting into. So if this season, I'm in. This we're waiting for. And you. gladly so. I'm sorry. I'm in. Yeah! yeah. <laughs> Very quickly, what did she do right? One, she knew her market, did the research. This is the basic stuff. Two, she came in with uber amounts of integrity. 
She'd actually prepared. She walked in. But three, and this is for me what got to me about this young lady, is she was thinking in an exponential way. She wasn't thinking incrementally. She actually thought about the problem as it exists and how do you create a solution to the problem that is not only sustainable but scalable. Building an Uber but for hairstylists. Now, what many people don't know who watch the show is we weren't granted money to do the show. This was our own money. So if I commit two million rand to a single business, I'm committed. That's it. I'm in. So we put in about 800,000 rand into this young lady at various stages in her business. She's only just turned cash flow positive. But at each time when we've put in money, there's been so much dilution in the business that I now own probably less than 0.1%. Here's the thing about Shemaine, which makes her amazing. She had the courage to see it through. So we gave her the first batch of funding. With the first batch of funding, she went to market and tested the business, and it failed. It didn't work. Of the five of us, three felt she should stop. She didn't take our advice. She kept going. She left her flat, sold her home, moved back into her parents' house, sold her bigger button, sold her car, moved back into her parents' house, took the proceeds from the car, and then funded herself for a further three months. When we saw that she was committed, put in a bit more money and a bit more money, Mpulu is now really supporting her, and now she's profitable and cash flow positive. So the main idea here is that it's possible. You've got to stop thinking in the small business way. She's not trying to start a small business. To create an Uber for hairstylists is not thinking small. Her market isn't Joburg. It's Joburg and Paris and New York and Moscow and London. That's her market. And she can if she wants to. Each and every single person in this room has a Facebook account, yet the creator of Facebook doesn't know any of you exist. Because the power of what the Americans do is they teach their children to think and build for the global community. We teach them to think and build for the people around the corner. So if you think about it, and I said this to the minister of small business, entrepreneurs are not, we're not, we don't ask for a lot. We need six things, six things, just six, just six things. Give me these six things, I'm happy. First thing you must give me is an infrastructure that works. Roads without potholes, government departments that work. So when I need a tax clearance, I can get it quickly. When I want to register my business, it happens quickly. Second thing you must give me is access to markets. I need that. Third, strong administration ability. Fourth, the right people. And here is the real challenge we face with helping entrepreneurs build businesses today. It's the people. Smart people who are very well qualified and able don't start businesses. They get high paying executive jobs and companies and they stay there. And most of them think about it, they come up with the idea, but they never leave. And so because of that, in truth, you don't get a ratchet up of talent coming into the entrepreneurship ecosystem. And finally, they need capital. The money doesn't have to be cheap, but it does have to be patient, which is why we can't be asking our banks to do it. So I want to close very quickly with this. If you think about it, there are three different ways people build businesses. So what do we need? We need four things. The first thing we need is people that build with a philosophy. I come from a township called Whatville. In my township called Whatville, right across us was, a small, was another township called Actonville. And the only thing separating Whatville from Actonville was a railway that used to run across. It's actually an interesting story. Whatville was a massive township. And the apartheid government understood that the bigger the township got, the less their ability to control the people who lived in it. So what they did was they split the township in half, took families and moved them to another township now called Daviton in the East Strand. And on the part from which they moved them, they moved in a new community of people, Asians, Indians specifically, and it was called Actonville. In the township that I come from, the same shops that I went to, I used to buy fish and chips for my mom if she'd sent me there, or cigarettes for my uncle, those same shops are still there. Because whilst in my township, we were building small little spaza shops to sell lustro, the Indian people across the railway were thinking differently. And they were thinking about how do we create legacy businesses? So Nana's, who started with a small dry cleaner, then moved out into a sports business, then moved into a food business, own all three of those businesses because their thinking is at a different level. Now, I'm arguing that we need neither the sustain or legacy thinking. What we need in South Africa today is we need a philosophy of thinking. We need people that are going to build businesses on the premise of a philosophy. What do I mean by philosophy? Something that is just not relevant to the time. 
So when Steve Jobs started Apple, what did he say? He said, I want to build a business that will enable humanity and computers to have an intuitive relationship. That's why an Apple is easier and more friendly to use than an Android device. It's not by mistake. It is. It is. Upgrade yourselves, comrades. Upgrade yourselves. Yeah. Levels to these things. Levels. You must listen to AKA. So what do we need to do? We need to start building businesses with philosophies. Not just another me too business or just another sustained business, but a true business with a philosophy. And a business with a philosophy is a business that has an idea so strong that the idea transcends time, transcends culture, transcends people. The idea holds. Do you know what the philosophy for Google is? Do no harm. Whatever they do, however much value they add in community, whatever information they amass, all they're saying is we exist for the simple purpose of doing no harm. Virgin says, make money, have fun. Tell me that that's not an idea that transcends time and culture. And so the whole idea is we need to start thinking about building philosophy businesses. That's how we get the country out of the mess. Second thing is we need a strong system of mentorship. This is a real problem, because those of us that make it never go back to help those that haven't. If I may, and my fellow South Africans of different demographics, please excuse me for a moment. Let me say this to my people. Us, as a people, must be the only people that measure our success not by how many other successes we create, but by how many failures we see around us. We make money, we move out, we buy fancy cars. Then every Saturday, we go back to the places from which we come. We find our friends who couldn't make it out. We stand with them at the Shisanyama just so we can show the little that we've amassed. And until we create a mindset where we go back to build those who need to be built, we will not create a better South Africa. The third, and I feel really strongly about this. I don't know, I heard Azania spoke about it, I wasn't there when she did the intro. But we really need to begin to reward a culture of delayed gratification. Delayed gratification. Delayed gratification doesn't mean no gratification. It just means if you can wait, wait. Because your time and opportunity will come. There was a clip I thought about showing here, but I didn't. A young man who came to Dragon's Den raised two million rand from me, as it was, and I funded him. His name was Johan, and Johan came with his dad. I gave him two million. I gave him two million on the premise of what he committed to me on the show. Now, the contract for the show says that we have only one proviso as Dragons, that we can do a due diligence after the show. And when I did the due diligence, I asked him very specific questions about how he'd conducted himself and his business. And he gave me very specific answers. And the only thing I was asking him was I was trying to understand the man's lifestyle. Because two million rand is a lot of money. When I give it to you, where is it going to go? Then, after that was done, in our office, we did an audit. And when we started doing the audit and checking the information he'd given us, we actually understood that his problem is he's a brilliant business person. He's just very bad at managing his personal lifestyle. And so because he mixes his business life with his personal life, his business is now not investment worthy. This is a culture of conspicuous consumption where because you have it, you need to show you have it. You ever thought about what we do? We buy things we don't need to impress people we don't like who won't even remember that we bought those things. It is the most fascinating mental thinking. Fascinating. And finally, and this is the challenge to those of you here who are budding entrepreneurs. Put up your hand if you've written a business plan. Throw it away. In fact, I'll make an even briefer recommendation. Burn it. And I want you to watch every single part of it burning. You know why? Because a business plan is a lie. You know the history of business plans? They were created in the 1930s by the Americans. You know why they created them? Because in 1929, this small little thing called the crash happened in Wall Street. And when the crash happened, the Americans went, wait, they went, wait, why did the crash happen? It crashed because we lent money to big businesses without assessing those businesses' plans. Yeah, we need a way to assess their plans. And so they came up with, can you believe it, the very same system we use today of writing business plans. SWOT analysis. 
strength, weaknesses. <laughs> you know, the strength and, the, and then the opportunities and the threats. Then you put it on a slide. Woo, investor, I've got strength. And then I've got weaknesses. And then... So the Americans created that system, but they created it for big businesses. As an entrepreneur, let me tell you, I write a business plan in Jan. In March, it's, not, it's useless because the market has changed. New competitors have come. New people are doing new things. The product I wanted to launch is no longer relevant. My only speed, my only speed as an entrepreneur is the speed of light. And so the only resource you have as an entrepreneur to compete with big businesses is you can move faster than they can. That's it. Because you can't outbox them, you don't have more money, and you don't employ people who are just as smart as the people they employ. But what you can do is you can move much, much faster. You can get to the customer quicker, you can service them faster, and you can stay much closer to that customer. Stick to that. And so what I'm saying here is we need to think about starting businesses. Just start. Throw away the business plan. Start. Start badly. Make a mistake. Fail. Make a big chamorros. Come back. Do it again. But just start. Now that I've told you everything I've told you, I thought about what's going to be my dusty rich moment. Yeah, yeah. Now, I was going to take off my pants, but hey, this whole room would go dark, man. There'd be no space. It just, it wouldn't work. It wouldn't work. Because, you know, Dusty, I'm Zulu. I'm, let's say, I'm working with different equipment here, Chief. The reason I'm wearing pants is, is, is called asset management. Risk management, comrades, different. You and I. Because when you took yours off, I was like, where, where is this thing? <laughs> where is this? Where is it? I asked my assistant, I'm like, Palace, can you see it? Where? It's not there, man. <laughs> I belong. <laughs> now, so... In, in December this year, I had the amazing privilege. There's a, a global organization called Meetings Net. It's the largest gathering of meetings planners and corporate companies around the world, about 12,000 of them. And every year, they issue a book. It's called the Golden Book. And it's the book of the top speakers in the world that year. They only put in 12. It's never an ordinal fashion. So number one is not number one. Number 12 is not number 12. They just say these are the top speakers in the world this year. 12 of them. In the 68-year history of this being done, no South African has ever been on the list, no African has ever been on the list, no person of color has ever been on the list. This year in December, I was really humbled, I broke all three of those records. Amazing. And I... I just, I don't know where all of you are from a faith perspective, but I do want to say that it's not me. It's because God has given me the most incredible ability and talent. Now that I've told you what I've told you, let me tell you why after over a decade of speaking in now 49 countries around the world, you are likely to walk out of this room and do absolutely nothing about what I've told you. See, it hit me about six years ago that I was working with people all over the world and speaking. And yet every time I would speak, my business model depended on them not acting. So they'd bring me back again. <laughs> so I issued my, I told my team, my research team, I said, find out for me, why do human beings look for new knowledge only to take the new knowledge and do exactly the same old things they were doing with it before? It sounds stupid. And here's what we found. Each and every single person in this room is held prison by two biases, two. The first is the confirmation bias. All of us live in a world where we look for information to confirm the beliefs we deeply hold. You know, the country's going bad. Just, yeah, look, Jacob Zuma's fired in Klantla. Again. No, he only fired him once. Yeah, but again he's done it. Some Harvard professors did a bit of interesting research, and this wouldn't be a professional talk if I didn't use Harvard, you see. <laughs> did you notice how my accent changed when I said, some Harvard professors? Harvard. It's not Harvard, it's Harvard. <laughs> you must lift it at the end, Harvard. The D is silent. Yeah? 
But some Harvard professors did some interesting research in the 1980s. They took two groups of MBA students. In fact, they took a single group of an MBA class. It was 40 of them and split it into two, 20 each. They then took pieces of research and gave them to these groups. The pieces of research proved a single thing. So could you imagine where I took some papers and research and gave it to this side of the room that proved that the sky is blue? Then I came to this side of the room and gave you pieces of research that proved that the sky is pink. And at the end of the day, you believe the sky is blue, you believe the sky is pink, but we're talking about the same sky. The following day, they came back. Now, these are smart people, top 1% of the intellectual capital of the world, MBA students at a Harvard Business School. And they took the research they'd given to this group and gave it to the other, and the research they'd given to this group and gave it to the former. They took the research that proved the sky is pink and gave it to the group that believed the sky was blue, and took the research that proved the sky was blue and gave it to the alternative group. But here's what they did. In what was 80 pages of hard, heavy statistical data, they left three small traces in bullet points of evidence that proved what they believed the day before. And without fail, both groups, at the end of the day, found those three pieces of evidence and defaulted to the belief they held the day before, even in the light of overwhelming evidence to the contrary. Because as human beings, we are hardwired to look for information that confirms the deeply held beliefs we have. The country's going down, so you drive, past the, you drive past the traffic light and there's a person begging. You see, I told you, the country's going down. If you look for the evidence, you'll find it. The second thing is this, the status quo bias. Most of us like things the way they are. Do you know human beings are fascinating creatures? We are the only creature that is adapt to change and yet hates making the change each time it needs to. Because I don't know about you, when Mandela was president, I'm like, yes, Mandela, stay. Who's Tabo now? Who, who's Tabo? And then Tabo came and we were like, oh, he's smart. Tabo, stay. And then Tabo was going, we were like, ah, guys. And then Khalima came and we were like, who's this now? Oh, we don't have to worry, he's going? Okay, that's cool. And then Jacob came. Hey, she's still here. But <laughs> the status quo bias simply says you and I will look for every piece of evidence to support the status quo as we know it. The reason I will tell you what I have told you, and I've noted some of you taking notes. I'm very happy to share a full copy of this presentation with Mark. And Mark, you can send it to everybody here. I prepared it just for you. You can have it and do with it what you like. But the reason we are likely to do nothing about what we've learned here is simple. Because we like the status quo. And we will look for evidence to confirm what it is we believe. This beautiful country of ours is at an interesting time. It is a time unlike any other. It is a time when we, all of us as South Africans, need to pull together to build a country worth living in. Because regardless of your race, I can assure you we all want the same things. We do. It's the politics that divide us. Do you know what we want? You want a country where you can jog at 11 o'clock at night and you don't have to look over your shoulders. Where if you got harmed driving out of here and you went to a public hospital, you would get A-grade public hospital service. Where if you sent your child to the public school around the corner, they would receive a global standard of education. We all want the same things. But in truth, we are divided because we forget that what this country needs from all of us is a little bit of faith. What is faith? Faith is the ability to see the invisible, believe in the impossible, and trust in the unknown. And so I wish you, your companies and your families and this beautiful country of ours, just a little bit of faith. Thank you very much.